Hey, everybody. It's been a long time since I've done anything on Zoom now that uh, touring life has sort of continued. But I'm here um, in my living room in New Orleans. Uh, I brought my kids to work this morning. The space is a mess, but um, I'm very excited to be here with you to talk about my work and to talk about uh, my perspective on how my work has manifested. Um, you know, as mentioned, both of my parents emigrated to the United States um, from Haiti when they were children. Uh, this was under the Duvalier regime. And throughout my life, I feel like that's something uh, that I've always wanted to understand more about. Like, how did I become American? How do I have this identity? How do I have this duality um, in my experience? And um, I think music has been just a, such a critical point of reconciliation for my, for my own identity, but also for understanding all of this history. Um, I really came to learning more about New Orleans history and Haitian history um, from moving from my native New York. I, I graduated from NYU in 2007. And about three years later, I came here um, really because I, I, I intentionally wanted to focus on my creativity. I wanted to um, explore music in New Orleans. And I read this book called The World That Made New Orleans by Ned Sublette, which hopefully you guys know about. But if you haven't, I feel like it's essential reading for um, understanding New Orleans, Louisiana, um, but also its relationship to the Caribbean. And over time, I started to realize the, the incredible imprint that Haiti has had on New Orleans culture, you know, for a city that is entirely, um, you know, sort of dependent on tourism for its economy. So much of that tourism is the music and the culture and the dance. And despite Haiti's um, impressive influence, it, it goes completely unspoken. And so I started to really become curious, not only about Haitian music, but why is Haiti so unspoken of in the United States? You know, I, by then I knew that Haiti was the first independent black nation in the Western hemisphere. I understood that a country founded on the principle of the abolition of slavery is a threat to any Western uh, power and uh, any Western power structure. Um, and so I started to recognize that conversations about Haiti as it pertains to anything in the United States um, really expose the complicated political relationship between the United States and Haiti. Um, that Haiti has been a, a well for me, and I think for many people of inspiration, not only in its founding principles, but in its culture, you know? Um, and they always say in Haiti, you know, it's 80% uh, Catholic, 20% Protestant, 100% Voodoo. I was in a workshop last week where I, I asked someone, um, who was on the panel with me, you know, what is voodoo? And and their example, which I thought was really beautiful, was, you know, it's like if if I go and I get a glass of water for someone and I give it to them, that's voodoo. But anyway, I feel like I mentioned that because that is so much a part of the ethos, I think, of this music and the creation of this music. Um, so much of it has been about um, survival and experiencing you know joy through 
through that survival, not just suffering through life, but, you know, the compulsion to, to express it in music for these songs to become sort of classic, you know, Haitian folk songs. Um, there's uh, just so much, you know, that we can analyze sort of historically and sociologically and that goes into these songs and politically. But, um, you know, here comes me. I started studying classical music through the public school system in Maplewood, New Jersey, where I grew up. Um, I think I'm creating this music because when I was in high school, when I was studying to become, um, you know, a classical cellist, I had visions of, of working in chamber ensembles and, you know, really just thought, okay, I play the cello. So the Western European classical music is going to be where I belong, um, that ended up not being true, thankfully. Um, my, and and that I think is for a lot of different reasons. But I think that, um, you know, one of the things that really got me, I lived in West Africa when I was in high school. So that took me off of my um, conservatory kind of track. Um, so that's one thing. But also when I was 18 years old, I went to a party in Brooklyn and I, I met a cellist named Rufus Cappadocia. He's actually Canadian. He's from Hamilton, Ontario. But I met this cellist named Rufus Cappadocia who became a mentor to me. And he was playing with a band called the Voodoo Drums of Haiti. And that was just such an aha moment in my life because I had never thought of the cello as being a vehicle for expression of voodoo or of Haitian music, or even something to be in conversation with Haitian music. And now, you know, nearly, well, about 20 years later, um, that is a thread that I have really carried throughout my work and throughout my music. Um, I'm gonna start by playing you one of the first um, songs that I ever learned how to sing in Haitian Creole. Uh, I'm not fluent in Haitian Creole. That's some, that's something that I'm still working towards. Um, but I have been learning a lot ab about uh, the Creole language through the songs. Um, you know, for me, it's been a very uh, orchestrating, arranging, um, deciding which instruments to use because I also play banjo, I play cello, and I play guitar. Deciding which of these instruments to use um, has always been such an intuitive process. And I think that there are so many, uh, you know, potential layers <laughs> to, that, to that process to deconstruct. I think one of the things that feels very, um, you know, I, I, was, I was laughing to myself thinking, man, this talk, how the cello became a vehicle for um, arranging Haitian music is really, it's, it's so much more than just the cello or just Haitian music. It's more like, you know, the fact that I even play the cello feels um, somewhat miraculous. You know, I've always been, um, I've always felt very othered in, in a Western European music setting. Um, the cello, I consider it one of the happiest accidents of my life. Being able to connect it to my Haitian heritage has uh, just been, you know, something that feels so fateful and and predestined. But it's also very, in my in my perspective, it's just very, um, you know, African. It's very Caribbean to use the tools that you have to express the things that you want to be able to talk about or that you want to um, that you're processing yourself. And for me as a, you know, a daughter of the Haitian diaspora, I'm processing um, why, sorry, I'm processing why um, and how I exist and well, what my role is in, um, in uplifting Haiti. Um, so anyway, I won't, I won't go on and on about that, but. Awesome, I'm gonna play you this song. It's called La Tibonite, and it's uh, one of the first songs that I learned how to sing in Haitian Creole. And um, it's an old song. When I discovered it, 
I thought that I had discovered something that nobody knew about, and then I come to find out everybody knows this song. And so um, this is a, a song about the Artibonite Valley and the Artibonite River. And the song is saying, when I, when I go to the sun, it tells me uh, that when, when, wait, when I go to the La Tibonite, they tell me that the sun is ill and it's lying still. I went to go see the sun. I found the sun had died. And the second verse is, you know, the, the sun is ill, it's lying still. I went to go see the sun and I found, um, I found it had died and it hurts my heart to have to bury the sun. back to uh, early pandemic days <laughs> I was doing a lot of a lot of shows on the internet and uh, I really miss being around people even now um, so that was a, a, a song that you know cello is not an instrument that is historically used in Haitian music at all but I found 
uh, I find that the cello in general just has this unique power in that it it can be a chordal instrument. It can be something that um, expresses the rhythm. It has this incredible range, and um, you know now there's so much, so many more string players that are you know, contemporary string players exploring music in ways that, you know, our previous generations hadn't reached. Um, but to me that, that the cello just feels like it really, um, you know, encapsulates the, the meaning of the song. Um, La Tibonite, uh, that song is so devastating, you know, for me, it was like such a discovery that, uh, you know, the stories of people's lives in past generations exist in these songs, and, and that feels so important to, to continue to sing them. Um, I want you to play you next a song that I wrote. I'm not going to play it on the cello. I'm going to play it on the banjo, <laughs> which I know goes against the, the title of this talk. But, um, you know, the banjo for me has such a unique place in um, in Haitian music, in American music, in co any conversations about uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you know, I, I, I remember reading about okra coming to the United States and, um, and coming to the so-called New World and enslaved people people who had been captured and, and were, were going to be enslaved and, and working um, in the Caribbean in the United States hid okra seeds in their hair. I kind of feel like um, banjo is, is like an okra seed. Um, you know, originally uh, the banjo, now we know it comes from West Africa, um, but it's taken a long time and I think we're still in the process of destigmatizing um, the banjo. There's a lot of stereotypes of the banjo. Banjo evokes a certain kind of image, and um, and it's not of a black woman playing. Um, so that's you know I've been part of an effort um, for many years in creating more conversations about the significance of the banjo about uplifting uh, beautiful music that is derived from the banjo. And one of those traditions is the, the Chubadu tradition in Haitian music. Um, traditionally, Chubadu bands are uh, cha-cha, which is like the maracas, banjo, and tambu, um, which is the Haitian drum. So, you know, I have been using a lot of uh, you know, in playing the banjo, it feels like a subversion because, first of all, I never grew up in a community of Haitian troubadour players. I'm a woman. Um, you know, troubadour music is the secular uh, music form that's really, I kind of liken it to um, hillbilly music from Haiti. Um, and it feels a lot more, uh, feels a lot more like uh, just this country music from Haiti that um, hasn't really been put on um, the world stage as much as I, I believe it deserves to be. But I, I wrote this song um, called Fort Dimanche, uh, inspired by a testimonial of a journalist in Haiti who had interviewed someone who had survived time at Fort Dimanche, which was uh, Duvalier's political prison. And um, that uh, is, a, is something that I've always been interested about because my, you know, like I said, my, um, both of my parents emigrated to the United States under the Duvalier regime in the 1960s. It's a period of time that I've been really curious about um, throughout my life and to have had someone who actually survived being in prison there, um, I think is really incredible to be able to hear about their experience. And I think human stories and experiences really, um, when they're stored in songs, kind of retain this kind of potency that um, 
I'm addicted to apparently. <laughs> this is how I've framed my career. But um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Fort Dimanche was a political prison under Duvalier, mentioned that, but really anyone who was seen as a potential dissident of the regime was um, detained. A lot of people were tortured, executed, uh, absolutely horrific um, conditions. Um, and so I took some of the words that this man had said in Creole and, um, and used that as the basis of this song. But he kept on saying, Malé no pays son chapeau. I'm going to the land with no hat, which means he kept on thinking I'm going to die. Um, and so, yeah. And there's another, uh, so my last project, um, my last record is called Breaking the Thermometer, and it's inspired by um, Radio Haiti's journalist. Radio Haiti was a radio station that was owned by a man named Jean Dominique from about 1970 to the year 2000. And um, he was tragically assassinated in the year 2000. Um, there's a, an amazing film about his life called The Agronomist that was made by Jonathan Demme. Um, if you want more um, information about him particularly. But I was invited to create a multimedia performance. I was commissioned by Duke University to create a multimedia performance based on these archives. And so it was a lot of listening to testimonials, um, you know, listening to jingles, listening to um, interviews, editorials, uh, and sometimes uh, they just throw a whole album on. And so, you know, it's incredible that these tapes survived because the radio station and independent press in Haiti was uh, under attack um, so much in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, when the tapes were transferred to Duke University, uh, to their library by Michel Montas who is um, a Haitian journalist, is also Jean Dominique's widow. She ran the radio station with him. So she, she gave me carte blanche to create a multimedia performance. And um, we've performed, uh, the full title is Breaking the Thermometer to Hide the Fever. And that's a phrase that comes from Jean Dominique, who likened the independent press um, to the thermometer of the people. And um, he said, you can break the thermometer, but it won't hide the fever. So that's how that became the title. Um, for me, it was an incredible uh, collaborative process. Um, I, it was 
also the first time that I was like, I don't think that I can really, you know, put this project together without working with drummers, without working with Haitian drummers who, um, who know these rhythmic structures, um, you know, and are kind of just have this, this knowledge of these rhythms, um, that are, um, very, uh, you know, uh, authentically Haitian, though authenticity is, you could go down a whole rabbit hole talking about what authenticity really means. Um, but I, you know, I found a lot of music that way. I, I found a lot of inspiration, of course. Um, and one of the pieces of music that I found was by um, a man who I admire very much. His name uh, was Franz Cassius. He emigrated to the United States in the 40s. He was a classical guitar player. And he was insistent on categorizing his music as um, Haitian classical music. And he was very much pushed into identifying himself as a folk artist. Um, I know that that was a, a sort of conflict uh, that he managed much of his life. Um, you know, it reminds me of even someone like Nina Simone, who really felt pushed into being a uh, jazz and blues artist when really she wanted to be respected as a classical musician. And so I find myself in quite the opposite position. I've come from a classical tradition and I've been, um, I wouldn't say fighting it, but I've been pointing at, at all the things throughout my career and through my music, all the things that make me uneasy about that identification. And so, you know, it just goes to show um, that I think the generation that I come from has a very a different and, and valuable perspective that's making for some interesting art. Um, but I want to play you this piece. Um, and this will be the last one that I play, um, and then we can open it up for question. This one is called Non Fon Bois. Um, there's so many uh, beautiful recordings of Franz Cassius playing this. Um, it's actually called Jan Valou on his um, solo, Pieces for Solo Guitar record, which is on um, Smithsonian Folkways. Um, Amos Coulange is another uh, Haitian classical guitarist who lives in Paris today. Um, so my version is sort of a, a melange between the two of their versions. Um, but I'm, of course, I'm playing it on cello and, you know, I just felt so lucky that um, this piece lays so well on my instrument. Um.
about how my journey to Haitian music has been largely through uh, Black American music and most specifically Louisiana music. Um, I've had a lot of fun playing cello on Cajun and Creole music from Louisiana. Um, it's also been kind of a window for me into learning uh, the language and um, certainly uh, learning French. Um, I've toured a lot in France. I've had more opportunities to speak in French and, um, and so that has kind of um, come out above Haitian Creole uh, in terms of facility for me, but you know, I'm very committed to Creole and, and dis it's how it is distinct from uh, French language. So um, I'm gonna play you this song that is not from Haiti, but is a Cajun song that I uh, arranged for cello. Uh, this one comes from one of my favorite Creole fiddlers, Ken Ray Fontenot, um, who really uh, just had such an amazing spirit. I, I never met him. Um, he died in the early 90s, but um, he's widely uh, acknowledged as one of the, you know, foremost, um, just, one of, just one of the best fiddlers, one of the fiddlers who really encompasses um, so many aspects of, of the Cajun and Creole music tradition. And so this one's called the Jogo Plumbo. And uh, the Jogo Plombo in, in Cajun French means jug of moonshine. And so this is kind of like a, it's a breakup song and it's a drinking song. And uh, it's saying, um, I've cried and I've prayed, I'm drinking my Jogo Plombo and 
It's all just to see your pretty face. And it hurts me so much that we can't be together. If we can't get along, you can thank your mother. If we never see each other again, you can thank your father. <laughs> and I, I always have to laugh because these some of these songs can be so uh, dark and depressing and sad. But, you know, they're always sung with a smile and there's a corresponding dance. And it's really about... For me, that, that whole thing about survival and music as a vehicle for surviving life um, just feels so critical to, um, you know, acknowledging the African diaspora and our, and our experiences in transmitting so much uh, pain and um, painful experiences into so much joy. Um, that's something that, you know, I'm always trying to get to in my music, so anyway, I'll play this one for you. curious what you all are experiencing, thinking, how this applies to your own work, what resonates, what feels um, questionable. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Leila. This was really, really important um, for me to see. And 
I love your playing. The the double stops were sending me to the stratosphere. I was like, wow, this is it. Um, as a realist myself um, and someone who thinks about these issues a lot when it comes to what happens when you have a young black child and you're given their first violin, they get their first cello, um, and they're taking Western classical uh, training initially. Um, mm -hmm. I was curious about the routes that we can take as black string players to not only learn about the diaspora, like what you were saying, um, how Haitian music came to through other black musical practices, but also um, the ways that it, it can expand. So in my experience, um, I play my viola in Arab music context because I am attracted, I love Middle Eastern music, right? Completely different system of notation. There, well, we can de debate if there is notation and things like that, right? So. I'm curious about the ways that when we're talking about different African musical practices, um, if there's been any struggle with um, some of the ways that you maybe were taught to play your instrument initially and the cultural practices that may not be um, like uh, trans, uh, what's the word? They may not be uh, passed down to right. you, to you based on your teachers and who you have access to. Uh, yeah, I mean, in my experience, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. I have to like lean in and really try to <laughs> hear the questions. Um, in my experience, the emphasis on technique in classical music um has overshadowed any like individual musicality or expression um that's something that i feel like i've been at odds with <laughs> my whole life um i think also the the reality that we don't have uh, a way of teaching string players to play by ear um, that everything is about, you know, in the beginning, maybe Suzuki, but no one's doing like, you know, Suzuki level 15. <laughs> it's like you do that <laughs> the first couple of years that you're learning uh, to play, you know, these really, really just know where the, where the notes are in first position. But um, I, I wish that there was some sort of system when I was learning my instrument when I was younger to be able to know what key I'm in, to be able to trust my own uh, internal compass about tone or pitch um, or even roll, you know? It took me, I, when I first started playing at jam sessions, I realized, oh my God, I'm supposed to be listening, not just playing. You know, the listening part of it is so essential to uh, the playing. And I feel like that doesn't get accented enough because there's so much kind of binary thinking of like wrong and right, and this is the right articulation for the time period, and this is the wrong one. And, you know, I'm sure that all of that has a place, but I think as someone who, you know, obviously I'm a songwriter, I'm a composer, so that was my, that was always like where my mind was going. But I wish that there was even an opening to address that. You know, in my education, I think that that's like a, a fault of the pedagogy. And that without that sort of being opened up, I feel, you know, I don't want to be an extremist, but I do feel like, you know, the, the classical tradition will not survive because we are evolving, you know, as a people. And there's way more people involved now. It's not just you know, white people who are descendants of Europeans, you know, it's so many other people who have, who have come to love this music and have access to this music and, um, and want to figure out how to make it more accessible. So we can't make it more accessible until we start changing the way that we frame it, you know? 
you know, even just going from classical music to Western European classical music, acknowledging that there's all sorts of classical music that exists in the world. You know, I wish that there was more of a holistic perspective of the music. Great. I think, uh, Chidi, uh, oh, unless Danielle, you had a follow up. Okay. I think Chidi was next and then Josh. And if we got time, I've got one and we'll see who else. Uh-oh. Oh, you're muted. Ed. Josh is no, muted. Can you hear me then? Ah. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. And it really raised a lot of thoughts on my side. Um, the For me, I'm looking at um, the cello and Haitian songs. And when, when you were speaking, I was kind of um, beginning to imagine the role of the keyboard, for example, in, in West African, or let me say Nigerian popular music. Mm -hmm. And half life, especially being one of the oldest popular music in Nigeria, which at the start of it, the the keyboard was not part of the the instrumentation or the orchestration. But at some point around um, the nineties, the keyboard now came in, and it's actually played in a particular way, peculiar way that is different from the way it was introduced to to the country. And that actually now brings me to the question I have for you. In the music already, I can hear the influences of um, Asian tradition in the sound of the cello. So I'm, I'm kind of asking if, if you can elaborate more in terms of um, how does the Haitian folk tradition kind of influence the way the techniques, I would say now new techniques, because you are classically trained from, from, from what you said. Mm -hmm. How does the Haitian folk tradition now influence the way you interpret or play the cello in terms of techniques? Or has it developed new techniques on your side? And if it has, how does that actually now influence the, the way we, the listeners, hear the instrument, the, the timbre of the instrument? So that's actually what I want to do. Yeah. Well. I think that for me, you know, Exploring Haitian music has been more about chasing a certain sound or feeling in the music. And it hasn't been like this, you know, super heady process of figuring out which technique is going to fit. It's been like, okay, how do I get that sound that I want out of my cello? Or how do I play with the bow when there hasn't been a bow on any of this, <laughs> on any of this music? Um, you know, what does the bow sound like? What does it feel like? What it is, what does it evoke? Um, and, you know, of course, the, the lowest hanging fruit is like, you know, sometimes that's just an emotional, it's a different sort of emotional connection. It's like building a bridge to something that I know is already a part of me and is inside of me, but also I didn't come to it from, I came to it from things that were very, much in my environment and outside of me. Um, you know, I feel like the, the navigating um, questions about technique is always interesting because I think that that's another thing. Like, you know, I remember when I was in college and I was showing my cello teacher some of the things that I was exploring. I was bouncing my bow on the strings and I was, you know, slapping with my hand and I remember her saying like, you know, I just don't know what to call that. I don't know what to call that, but it is amazing. And I remember thinking, yeah, maybe I don't, I, I don't really know what to call it either. Um, of course, in classical idiom, it's extended technique. So I guess it's all extended technique. Um, but to me, it's just like these techniques exist on other instruments and I'm just taking them from other instruments into the realm of the cello. Um, you know, some of that stuff is just, I'm strumming. Um, I wish there was, it feels like more than strumming in a way because the cello's strings are so much heavier than a guitar or a banjo. But, um, but essentially it isn't, you know, it's taking this motion and doing this. 
Um, and so it's, it, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, our ideas about what technique is and how technique arises. And I think most techniques arise from the desire to create a certain sound. And so while I don't have a specific name for any of my uh, techniques that I'm employing on cello, I know that the goal is not to just like play in some kind of out way. It's more to get to this particular sound that I want to get. Um, and I think also, you know, I've been for the past 20 years exploring my instrument in a way that no one has really, like I haven't been spoon fed this. I've been learning from recordings and I've been learning from other uh, musicians. I've been learning old time American tunes from other musicians. Um, it's been very rare for me to actually be in a space with other Haitian music and immersed in that way. And so I've been immersing myself in the recordings, which, you know, I wonder how that would have changed my playing to have been able to be in Haiti for a year or to live in, live in Ghana for a year and play, you know, Ghanaian folk music. Um, you know, we'll never know because also technique arrives from our, our actual uh, technological relationship to the music. So I hope that that answers your question, um, but that's my perspective on it. Yeah, that it actually does, and uh, it, I think it opens up a kind of a bigger discussion around how the the new sounds that are discovered in terms of um, tamba in on instruments actually there are not yet enough vocabularies to be able to explain for for somebody to who wants to reproduce that kind kind of sound to be able to kind of come closely or as, as closely as possible to to reproduce in that. So my my next question is kind of personal. You you may not answer now. Is are you working of trying to kind of develop a kind of um develop um vocabularies that can explain or can help someone understand or reproduce these techniques that you use to evoke the Haitian tradition on the channel? It's it's a personal question, I think. Thank you. You so know, much. it hasn't. It, my focus has been more on composition and creation than in developing a construct for other players. But um, you know, I get to explore that in these conversations, uh, and hopefully, in the future, um, I'll be able to streamline some of this and and uh, you know, learn how to explore it in in more of a pedagogical. Um, method you know but right now it's just it's been a lot of creation and releasing um you know releasing uh music and and being a working artist that feels like the miracle of the day <laughs> i think we have time for one more quick question josh if you could uh if you can package it quickly yeah, I'll do my best. I'm still processing your wonderful answer to Chidi's question and uh, you know, relishing in all the beautiful music. Thank you so much for sharing um, it and, and your history and, and your process with us. I guess I'm, I'm curious about the arranging process itself because um, it seems as though in your presentation, you're sort of thinking when you're arranging traditional music, how best to serve this maybe idealized or internalized version of this this song. And instrumentation certainly plays a process in that. But relating it to Chidi's question, I'm really curious, when do you choose to pluck the strings and when do you choose to bow the string? Like, how does that part of it come into play? Hmm. Yeah, you know, like in the last, one of the last pieces that I played for you, the Nofon Bois, which was a Franz Cassius composition. Um, I just loved the sound of it plucked in the beginning because it kind of mimicked the guitar, you know? And then there's a, a break where there's like a another motif that comes in that feels like a response to the, those first statements that I felt like, oh, I want it to become more intense. So I'm going to switch to playing the bow. And, you know, also this is 
usually when I'm playing this piece, it's with the Haitian drums. And so there's something about that, you know, this music is ceremonial. And, um, you know, if we're talking about tradition, um, then we're talking about voodoo, and which is, you know, not just, we tend to think of tradition as like this thing that existed in the past um, that we've excavated and, um, and that we're trying to honor. But really, this is like this living, vibrant tradition. And this is this living um, thing that I really haven't grown up in. You know, I didn't grow up going to voodoo ceremonies, but I can feel in the music that, you know, maybe what we call like ostinato in the, in the drums is really just uh, evoking spirit. It's, um, it's turning something within us. And so I'm just kind of like following those those cues, like okay, when when has this phrase kind of completed, and when does it need to turn another thing? You know, when when what else do I want to evoke from this? And so, um, you know, I feel like the bow, and you know, plucking versus using the bow, it's just these completely different modes of expression. Um, and I, I do feel, you know, that the cello with the bow is so emotional, you know, it's, it's really, um, it brings up completely different feelings than the plucking thing. You know, the, when I'm plucking, it's like, oh yeah, that's a cool groove. That's a, that I want to lock into that. And when I'm bowing, it's like, wow, this is like, my heart is like opening, you know, <laughs> and this is uh, intense in a totally different uh, kind of way. And so I think just with composition in general, we're kind of manipulating those moments um, into like, what is this about? And, you know, that, that specific rhythm, Yang Valu, that is the basis for that piece, um, is calling uh, on Dambala, who is uh, uh, one of the loa, one of the, the spirits, and, um, and often is a snake, um, which symbolizes life and symbolizes, um, you know, the shedding of, of old skin and um, life emerging. And so that's what I wanted that song to feel like. Um, and then how do you get there? Um, it also feels really mysterious, much like life is. And, and so the, that's what went into uh, my actual, I guess, decisions about how to um, bring that in. I feel like when I'm plucking in the beginning, it's like I'm about to share a secret, you know? And then when I get on the bow, it feels like I'm proudly declaring what the story is, you know? Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> Unfortunately, I really, I really do hate to do this in the middle of such a lively discussion and interesting point, but this does bring us to the end of our time here today. So I'd once again like to thank the Actor Project for sponsoring our series. Uh, Layla, thank you so much for sharing your personal experience, for sharing your music, sharing the tradition, and just your inspiring talk, your beautiful playing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank and, you all. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming out um, from wherever you are. Hopefully this presentation has inspired you to learn more about timbre, orchestration, Haitian culture, Layla's music, and Africa and the diaspora more generally. If these sorts of things interest you, please, I urge you to join or at least follow the Sub-Saharan Africa and Diaspora Tour modules and other outputs from the series will eventually be available to both the public and members of ACTOR. Uh, videos from each of last year's presentations are actually already up on both ACTOR's YouTube page as well as the web page for this series. I'm gonna copy both of those into the chat right now. Uh, please don't forget though, this is just the beginning of this season of the series. Our next speaker will be Dr. Matthew D. Morrison on October 12th, which is next week. 
uh, same time. His talk is entitled Black Face, Black Sounds, and Black String Band Music. So really good time to be thinking about strings. I'm putting awesome. uh, Zoom information for that talk as well in the chat, um, but keep an eye out. Uh, we'll be posting information for that everywhere where you found information for this one. After Morrison's talk, we will have two other presentations, maybe three, in this season of the series, so please keep an ear open for details about those. Until then, once again, thank you so much, Layla, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Have a yeah, great day. See you all next time. Thanks for listening.